Yo, 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 we live on location, everybody. Knucklehead season six, full effect. We got the blackest one, and we got a very, 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 very special guest today. Hall of Fame, Dream Team One, one of the best to ever Legend. do it. Straight out of Brooklyn, New York City, we got Golden State's finest. Had a little bit of Indiana, but Golden State slash St. John's finest. We got Chris Mully. Mullen in the building. Run Appreciate TMC. you, OJ. T Run TMC you. in the building. <laughs> this the lucky lefty, y'all. Appreciate you, OG. My pleasure to be here, fellas. Appreciate you, Mullen. We appreciate you, OG, man. Proud of you guys, man. Keep up the good work. Yes, sir. Brought to you by Thigh Stop. First question we ask everybody is when you first got to the league, who's the first person to bust your ass? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. That's a long time ago, first of all, man. Yeah. Like, like, <laughs> a minute. And we got the cap out. We know you gave out a lot of buckets. You wasn't a you yeah. wasn't nah, a not, stopper. Not right away, man. Not right away. <laughs> <laughs> it took, it took me a little while to figure that NBA game out. Um I do remember my first game. I, I came in, and I don't know if you guys, when you, when you came in the draft, I don't know if they already had the uh, the rookie scale. Was that in place when you guys came in? Yes. Yeah. So that, that wasn't in place in 85. So when we got drafted, we were free. So I didn't go to training camp, and I showed up the sixth game of the season. Oh. Signed, signed my contract and played that night. Who you play again? And we played Seattle, and they had Ricky Sobers, Tom Chambers, okay. uh, Al Woods, so a bunch of guys that you know they they were men. You know, yeah. and you guys, and you guys came in young. I, I had I had done four years of school and still felt like a, a little boy, <laughs> right? Yeah. But as far as getting toasted, you said a Q. That was defense wasn't my thing. <laughs> At the end of the night, you know, I had I had to outscore my man. You yeah. know, what I mean? and, make it, and make it tough for him. You know, and we were playing. You know, especially when Nelly got here, we were playing the way they were playing now. We were trying to, you know, go fast run it pace. Up. Try to run it yeah. up. You know, on, on, on given nights, Nelly'd walk in the locker room and say, you know, that team can't score 120. He'd just write 120 on the board and say, we get that number, we out of here. <laughs> I like but, that. But, you know, I like you, that. you think about it, you know, when I came in, I, that was the first lottery. So that was Patrick Ewing, Wayman Tisdale, yeah. Xavier McDaniel, Joe Klein, John Conkak. I was the first non-center picked in that draft. Yeah. Now that's flipped upside down. Right. Yeah. You know, I looked last night. We, you know, we had the game last night with the, the Warriors in Minnesota. The top five scorers, besides Giannis, they're all they're all guards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the game has changed quite a bit. Um but it, it's I, I think for the better. You know, I like yeah. I like the freedom of movement and you know, when we get to the playoffs, we'll see more physicality. But uh, when you guys came in, man, <clears throat> I remember, you know, it's kind of like every decade things change. Yeah. <clears throat> and when you fellas came in, it was kind of the young, athletic, almost the start of positionless basketball. Yeah, the right. Yeah. So, Darius, you were long and lane. You could play. You you would play. You'd probably be a center right now. Yeah. You, you'd be able to switch across the board. One through yeah. five. Yeah. Space in the floor. Q, you, you'd you be able to play the four. Power four. Right. <laughs> right. So, and you guys would probably play 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Because as yeah. you get older, you had that three-point shot. You yeah. know, the, I would tell They get abused as much as we was. <laughs> well, you know, back in the day, there was shooters. You know, if you could shoot, that was one thing. But that didn't mean you could play. Right. Yeah. Like, I, yeah, he could shoot, but he can't play. Now, yeah. almost like in baseball where – like that middle relief became a new job. You could actually strictly be a shooter. And that's yeah. a, that's Stick a carved around. out, that, yep. that's a carved out position. Now that used yeah. to be something you had to do. Right. And you know, yeah. so yeah, the game's changed, man, but I, I, I love it. You know, you, we talk, you know, I'm doing the stuff with Darrell with the Warriors. So man, Steph's been tearing it up this year. So we, we've had a black. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. This is, this is a, a special episode because first, you know, they say I ain't go to college, but I'm still a St. John's representative. You did not you know, go to college. First you not a St. John's, John's representative. Representative <laughs> on our show. Stop hating Q. Time You're out. Rep St. John's representative on no, our show. No, he is not. 
I'm a Saint. I committed to Saint John's. I'm a Saint John's representative. Listen, who's I the coach? Say, no, who's the listen. coach then? Uh, who's the coach? Mike yeah. Jarvis. Mike Jarvis, okay. my man. We, I, I got him in my movie once I didn't Re- come. Respect. You know, sure he, we Mike Jarvis together. was in the movie, coaching, but no, he is not. You said that. And I, and I think there was an Ed Jordan connection there, too, because they were at yeah. Jordan's at the time. Yeah. Yep, all that. Yeah. Yeah. But you just said that he was our first guest from St. John's. We had Ron Ron. Oh, we did wow. have Ron Ron. I forgot. We Be, did have that's Ron. all I'm that. saying. Right. That's all I'm right. saying. Right. He right. ain't the point. I forgot Ron Ron, but he, Ron Ron gave us like 25 minutes because he was in and out real quick. That was a that was a crazy episode. And classic <laughs> Ron Ron mode. Ron that Ron sounds, gave us a side right. 20 minutes and got on up out of there real quick. <laughs> but we love him. But uh, I know you're a St. John's representative, man. Like a few years ago, we seen you and Patrick Ewing coaching your honor models and, and playing against each other, like man, all the history, the Big East wars, the careers, the man, to see your, your your guy over there coaching his team, you coaching your team, like how was that experience for you? Yeah, it was it was somewhat surreal. Um, you know, puts a timeline and everything. How how time flies. You know, <laughs> yeah. we came out. So in that in that eighty five lottery, that was the first year of the lottery. Patrick was the number one pick. Mm, yeah, we had we had played uh, in the McDonald's game together. We played against each other in AU. So you know, we went way back to to you know nineteen eighty eighty one. Played four years of you know big time rivalry between St. John's and Georgetown. And Patrick, when I, when I went to St. John's, I think I was there two years. He actually called me. Um, he was thinking he was coaching with maybe Orlando or somebody he said, you know, how's the college? And I just explained to him the differences of the NBA. Uh, and I didn't know why he was asking. I kind of had a, you know, feeling, but a few weeks later, man, he took the Georgetown job. And as you said, Q, uh, I mean, uh, Darius, when, when they came to St. John's, it, it was a big time flashback, man. It yeah. really was. The, the place was <laughs> packed. You know, our teams weren't that good at that time. But the, but the garden was rocking. Just the uh, energy in it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was cool as that. And then, you know, we, we, we had fun with it, man. We really did. We had, some, we had some really good games, too, against Georgetown. You know, Coach Conasecki was in the stands when Patrick came to the garden. Yeah. When we, w- when we went to, to play at Georgetown, uh, Big John Thompson was there. We got to talk before the game. And rest in peace to John. He was, you know, just a great, great trailblazer. Yes, sir. Um, so it was kind of cool. And, and Patrick and I always talked about, it was funny. You guys probably know this. When you talk to young players, you wind up really passing on the knowledge that was given to you. That's really yeah. what it's all about. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a day. There wasn't a day that didn't go by in practice that I didn't find myself saying something that either Coach Carnesecca uh, t- taught me or Don Nelson, you know, Larry Bird, all the guys that I played for, just passing that knowledge on uh, and really trying to. Uh, you know, in college, it's a little different in the NBA, trying to guide them as well as making the best they can be. All those kids want to be pros. Most of them will not be. Right. But trying to use those, that motivation, inspiration, you know, for work ethic, discipline, um, you know, passion, things that are going to work beyond basketball, you know, later on in their lives. Did you ever see yourself want to be a coach or at what point did it become like, I can coach. I'm, I'm interested in coaching. How did that all come about? Yeah. I don't know how you guys were when you retired. The first thing I wanted to do was get off that schedule of traveling, jumping yeah. on planes. So I took two yeah. years. I took two years off and really just kind of chilled and, you know, hung at the house. Um, then I went into the front office with the Warriors. I took two years as kind of a special assistant, learned, learned the front office gig. Um then I, I I was lucky enough to get the GM job. Did that for like four or five years. Went and did some TV at ESPN, you know, for about three years. Went back to Sacramento. At that point in time, um, it was one of those things in my head. I'm like, I always felt like I could do it. And I found myself analyzing coaches and players. But I'm like, you know, if, it was something, you know, they, they had approached me several times, St. John's, and I was always, like, against it. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to coach, man. That's not my thing. Um, but then it got to the point where I was like, you know what? If I don't do it, I'm going to regret this. It's always going to be like, what if? So I kind of I kind of really was pretty a quick decision. I said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to jump into this. I had, I had, you know, I had started doing a little 
because I was thinking about getting into assistant coaching the NBA. So I had all my playbooks from, from different teams I was on. I started getting together somewhat my philosophy on what I would do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, opp that opportunity was presented to me. I had, had done some research on it. So I jumped in. Um, I'm glad I did it. We had a really fun four years. We improved each and every year. And it was just a good experience to find out um, just another side of basketball, you know? Um, yeah, so, I mean, it was a good experience. It was enough for me. Four years was enough. The recruiting was a grind. You know, everyone says that, but when you get into it. That is, that. listen. Woo. You know, the, so the one thing is practices, games, film work, all the basketball stuff I loved. Mm -hmm. The other stuff kind of took a little bit of my passion away. You know, it wasn't enough basketball. It was too much other stuff. That's, yeah. that's, that's my issue with the whole different side of it. Like, uh, I would, I couldn't even, I would never say never, right? But I just couldn't see myself going back to college and trying to recruit and chase behind people and do all that. I enjoyed my time in Detroit being on that side of it, being in the front office and, you know, being able to work with players and all of that stuff. But like you said, it's a, it's a lot of the other stuff that comes with it that us as players, we just aren't used to because we, we've we always been about the game, playing the game and, and things that come with that. And a lot of those people, and there's no disrespect to nobody, but a lot of those people that didn't play the game and play at the level we played at, we don't even have some of the same concerns that they have. They they bicker and complain and fight over some of the things that make absolutely not any sense to us. We don't even care. Like We don't care where we sit on the bench. We don't care about any of those things. We just purely like want to be able to be a part of the game, be around it and be, be able to impact the game. But like, I'm with you on that. That that kind of turns you off on everything when it's that that other element. Yeah, and, and I don't know if you guys have followed, but it's like even right now, the way uh, guys are transferring, you know, just overnight, you got to redo your roster. That's the newest thing now. I, that 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 snuck up on me. I had to ask my my friend, the coaches in college, like, "Yo, what's going on with this? Like, they can now transfer and play immediately, so it's just like open season." Yeah, and then you think about the younger players are the more consistency you need to get any kind of rhythm and chemistry and, and teamwork. So that, that became a little disheartening. So it, I guess, so, you know, I wasn't one of those lifers, you know what I mean? If I was a lifer, like I'd still be playing if I could play, right? I'd still, like, yeah. I love playing. That's, you just playing the other day when I talked to you, Molly. You yeah, was at the man, gym, you, know you so, me from the floor. You was on the court. Yeah, yeah. so like that, that was, that's a love of mine. Like I love that. Everything mm -hmm. else after that was okay, but it wasn't, it wasn't it. You know what I mean? I would have, you know, like I said, man, that's, so some of those guys that coach forever, that's their passion. That They love that. Yeah. I don't love it like that. Yeah. Who was it that you seen that, that started you wanting to play basketball? Who was ones you watched and be like, man, I want to be like that Who was on Muddy's wall? Who's, what posters you had? Guys? <laughs> well, it's funny. So initially, so when I was a kid, you know, third, fourth, fifth grade, I was a swimmer. Mm. Oh, so I was nice. a swimmer. I, I played baseball, but but so the swim meets were on Sundays, and so were my basketball games. So you know, at first yeah, the coaches, were, one, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, at first the coaches were cool. Like I'd go swim one Sunday, I play ball next Sunday. The basketball coach said, "Man, you need to you need to like." make a decision. I'm like, fifth grade? I want to do both. But anyway, so that, that's how that came. I, so I chose basketball. I was swimming. Um, my older brother was the first person I watched. But as far as like, man, I was one of those guys. I just watched like, so growing up in Brooklyn and New York, and then when, when I was a kid, the Knicks, they had won championships. Oh, you my, my, my guy was Clyde Frazier, man. He was the Clyde. coolest. Clyde. Coolest yeah, guy man. on the planet now. No doubt. Still is. And still, still, and still is. is. Still <laughs> is right now, yes. But that, that was a great team to watch, The you know, with uh, Clyde Frazier, Earl Monroe, Bill Bradley, uh, Dave DeBush, and Willis Reed. Willis so Reed. that's kind of, that was my introduction to You grew up on the right NBA. era of the Knicks basketball. Well, and there, and, and one thing I loved about their team and the Celtics, ball movement so mm -hmm. so the Knicks um mantra at that time was hit the open man they were just moving that ball and just made it look easy so that, that was the first team I followed uh as far as players man like I said Walt Frazier I love Pistol Pete you know my read books on him 
John Havlicek, I studied, yeah. studied Hondo. And then moving forward, like when I was in high school and college, in my generation was Magic and Larry. Yeah. Those were guys that, you know, yeah. kind of transformed college basketball. That, you know, it was like, damn, these guys are. Yeah. So is it true that you picked 17 because of Hondo? Yes. Yes. You wore 17 because of Havlicek. So, because so of my, Havlicek. My, my high school coach was a big John Havlicek fan. He was always telling me to watch him and study him. Um, yeah, so that was, that was, I was passed on to me from my high school coach, but yeah, when, when I came to the Warriors, uh, Terry Teagle had 20, so I just slid over to 17. Mm. Okay. Yeah, for, for John Havlicek. Yeah, that's true. Let me ask you this though, right? As, as, like you say, you from, you, you, you from Brooklyn, you know what I'm saying? But, but, but you played an awful lot in the, in the hoods, in the neighborhoods. And for you to be as good as you were, at any point did you get just like, hey, he just a white boy. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, did you get the that, that, whatever it was, just from the doubt or the the like once you were killing, would did you see like the disbelief? Like, hold on, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I can't do nothing with this dude because you didn't look like them or whatever, and they didn't think that you should be doing. Did you ever deal with that coming from a place like a, a New York type environment that you ever get like looked at or, or called out for like not somebody not thinking you deserve the credit you were getting and then you had to go like show like nah this is, this ain't no bull this is legit like I'm, I'm, you, I'm Hall of Famer for a reason nah like yeah like this ain't this ain't no folklore no folk tale this ain't you know how it is in high school it wasn't internet and everything so it was like when you hear right, about somebody right. it's like <clears throat> what and then it's like. Did you ever deal with that when they see you like, this is who this is? And then you had to like, afterwards, it's like, yeah, this is who this is, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so probably the difference is, like you said, Q, without, without you know, YouTube and all other stuff, it was, mm -hmm. it was word of mouth and it only lasted for that game. You had to come right. back and, and do it again because mm -hmm. not everyone saw you. So you had, every time you stepped out there, it was time to reestablish that you could really play. As far as, yeah, I'm sure it happened. I'm sure it did, but not to where it bothered me. You know what I mean? Right. It didn't, it didn't bother me. Um, and, uh, you know, and you guys, I'm sure you, you agree. Like, sports always broke down that, that bullshit, the barrier. It's like, mm. can you play or not? You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> and, and then with Victory! that, you know, and with that also is like, you know, I said it earlier. Then you get to know somebody, like really know them, not not just, you know, so if I was up in this in Harlem and I had other game, I wasn't going home. So I'd wind up going to, my, you know, one of my teammates houses. Exactly. And see how they live, not not just how they play, mm -hmm. meet their parents, meet. And then it was different than me, but but I got to know them as yeah. people. Yeah. And that, and it wasn't, that it wasn't some big deal. Yeah. And, over time, too, we you know we, we played three, four years ago. So these guys, those guys I played with, man, I still talk to them. They're my boys, man. They're my teammates, and it, it was a it was a huge advantage and, and a blessing, really, for me to get that education. To me, that was an education, yeah. and it opened up my eyes. It it taught me, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this we have some differences, but ultimately, we're the same. We're yeah. trying to get our games together, try to go to school. And their parents were trying to do what my parents were doing. Yeah. Get their kids an education to teach them to be productive citizens. That was yeah. the goal. And that, so to me, I always go back to that. You know, we're in a tough time, right? Race relations and all this, all this bullshit that's going on. I always go back to, you know, traveling on the train, meeting different people. Mm -hmm. watching, you know, just observing, you know, in New York to divert and, and you know, and experiencing it, not, not reading about it, not hearing about it, experiencing it. And I think the main thing is knowing, getting to know people yeah. mm -hmm. for who they are. Um, I think understanding the differences, but really more importantly, understanding how, how much alike we are. That, that's, that goes back to, you know, to sports for me, traveling on the train, the subways in New York, mm -hmm. and, and ultimately 
getting to know people and their families and, you know, what, what their yeah. situation is. They, they might have different situations, but that doesn't mean we're different. Yeah. We all, everyone does. Everyone has different situations. So, I mean, to me, that's probably the big, maybe a bigger blessing than all the things that came playing in the NBA. Is yeah, the, right. the, the, the relationship that I have, and I can pass it on to my kids so they yeah. can understand, understand what the world's all about. Yeah. And not, not, yeah. Be, not be closed mind and, and try and, you know, make your assumptions and your, and your um, decisions on people strictly just because, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, it's, that's just like one of the blessings. I, I always go back to that, you know, growing up, having, you know, being up in different neighborhoods and, but ultimately was getting to know these people as yeah. people. That's what basketball did for me, man. Like prior to to playing basketball, I had never been around like, you know, hanging out with, with, with white kids. I hadn't, that just not in my neighborhood. We were all black community. Like once I started playing basketball, my coach was white. You know what I'm saying? I got introduced to the first white people that I was going to be around and stuff like that. That was like, and it was culturing for me. You know what I'm saying? That, that got me cultured. That got me like a lot of the same exact things you just said that stripped down any type of thing, cause we had, we were gonna be around each other. So it just allowed me that visual to see. I, this is what I wanted to say though. You said one of the things, like when I said victory, like the reason why I said it, cause you, you said something that to me, that the it's the entire population of the NBA world that missed. Like I worked in the front office just like you. I, you know, I wasn't in that same high position as you, but I feel like what you just said should be uniform across the board. Like. When you look at how we scout players and how we look at players and do all of this evaluating the players, like the first question that should be asked and answered before we do any other evaluations is, can he play? You said it, either can he, either can play or he can't. The thing that frustrated me the most about being in the front office, Mully, is like, why are we wasting all of this time on a kid that really can't play? Like we we going, we going over all of these back and forth, but he ain't really fit the bill. Like we we arguing 15, 20, 30 minutes or however long on this one guy who at the end of the day, we arguing over things that like, okay, you could talk about those things, but the bigger thing is like he don't fit the bill. What we talking about? So why are we even doing this? And it just became it, it was like it was redundant to me. Like, why are we doing this? I found myself just being frustrated with the whole the whole conversation of it, like, bro, we sitting here talking about, I'm not gonna call nobody or try and do that, but like we talking about player X and it's like, why? <laughs> like, why? Or why am I doing a, a damn like Mully, feel me? I'm a scout, right? I'm that I, I did two years as a director of player development, two years as a scout. Now I'm a head, I'm a scout, a pro scout. I have to do a scouting report on LeBron James, Steph Curry. Carmelo, Dirk, this was before Dirk. Dirk is in his last year. I got to do a scouting report on Dirk. First of all, you have zero, you have, I don't even know what less than zero, but you have that chance of getting him. <laughs> Why are we scouting him? I don't know, but okay, cool. You think if we have a chance to get LeBron, Steph, any of these guys, they're going to refer to Q's scouting report from January 17th of 2000, whatever, just a random game. That's going to make or break whether we pick. Come on, bro. That was what I couldn't do with the job. I was like, none of this makes sense to me. Like, he can't who? Why are we talking about him? He can. Let's talk about him. Like, you know what I'm saying? But it's like, I feel like the analytics people and a lot of the people that don't play, they don't see it as simple as we do. Because with us, it's just either he can hoop or he can't. If he can, then we'll we'll get into this dialect with you. But if he can't hoop, I don't want to talk about it. And I'm going to get aggravated from talking about it because he can't hoop. Yeah, sometimes we we over uh, analyze and over complicate things, right? So, especially now, like you said, with analytics and technology, it's crazy. You know, a lot, a lot of those things they want on record for later on and things like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, we used to, you know, back when when I was actually first started, we used to bring a pad and pen. You know, it would be like like old school sky report. You know, he, he can shoot it. You know, he needs to work on his left hand like that. But like you said, the, those top guys. I mean, it's clear as day. You can watch one minute and know they're pros, right? And then <laughs> it's just who you like better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But even you know, like Dirk, you know what I mean? Dirk, Dirk got overanalyzed, I thought, coming in. Like, you know, is he European? What's he going to be? You know, but I, I think over time, though, 
the way the game's played now, there's, there's less concern about position and just straight. I was just funny. We were on last night with the Warrior game in the NFL draft. We did, you know, did a few hits on the NFL draft. I said, because the Niners were picking third. I said, yeah. third, third, you're picking talent, dude. Never mind all the other stuff. You need talent. And it's funny, mm-hmm. they were, there was a lot of uh, speculating they were going to pick Mac Jones. Mac Jones. Trey, yeah. Trey Lance has the higher ceiling. That's, yeah. you know, the, the, the lower you pick, you know, you might get a little more detail on the yeah. uh, on the tangibles. But when you're up top there, man, it's straight talent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Start, bench, cut. Right, right. You got to start one, you got to bench one, you got to cut one. I'm going to go a small forward in the 70s, small forward in the 80s, small forward in the 90s. Uh, I go Dr. J, Larry Bird, and Scottie Pippen. Who you start, who you cut, who you Damn. Bench. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is what he do every time with these questions. He puts you in the trick Same bag. players all the time? <laughs> no, nah, it'd be different players. Just, it'd be different, on the player. it'd be, it's always something that you can't, you know what I'm saying, that ain't easy. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I'm at Bird, Pip, and Doc. Oh, okay. I okay. like it. All right, I understand it. I'm, I'm gonna be decisive. Said. I might not be right, but I'm gonna be decisive. I, I like it. I, I like it. I, I definitely. I probably would have went that way. <laughs> Tell me this, like you said, you talk and about. By, but by the way, Doc paved the way for Bird, and Bird paved the way for Pippen. Yeah, yeah. 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 You game, oh, Doc, yo, you want to pull up some Dr. J in the ABA? Check that out. Oh yeah, yeah. nah, trust me, Dr. Check man. that out. Oh yeah. Tell me this, you talked about it earlier. Your draft was the first ever NBA lottery. So that was like mm-hmm. a, a game changing type draft. How was that for you? And you said you was the first guard, like wing player taken out of all of those centers. But like when all of that came up for you being, you know, you went four years, you you all everything at St. John's at this point, you know what I'm saying? Averaging crazy and you've been hooping. So you knowing that you about to be part of this, how was that for you when they announced this draft lottery? Like, did you know what it was? Did you know this? But how just take me back to that time and you're thinking, like, what what's going on and hearing all of this stuff about that? Yes, yeah, so you gotta uh you know, go back to 1981, two, three, four, like 85. At that point in time, college basketball was more popular than NBA basketball. Yeah, right. So it wasn't necessarily That's step crazy up here. originally. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we played our games at the Garden, mm-hmm. St. John's. We play an afternoon game. We'd have 19,500. The Knicks would come back and play at night. They'd have 7,000. Oh, wow. I had it like that. So, in a way, at that point in time, and, and David Stern did an amazing job transforming that, right? Changing the league and, and, and you know, selling it and, and – popular popularizing global globalizing it but sitting there and we all say it's a business right but that's the first time where you got no control like there's a there's a ping pong ball an envelope right. that's dictating your i'm like sitting there going one two and then at that point there was only seven seven teams were in the lottery so i wanted to be in seven i was, I was right. the last pick in the lottery wow and so that 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 you know that's an eye opener you sit i'm sitting home like you said, I had four great years. I'm from New York. Why do I want to leave? I don't want to leave. But that pick of the envelope, you're gone, dude. Bye. Right. right. So, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a introduction into the business world. Mm-hmm. And you know, it wasn't an easy transition for me. Um, but it's funny how 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 the league has grown and like you, like when you guys were coming up, you couldn't wait to get to the league. Yeah, could wait to go to the draft and get all right. the experience that we watching I, I every was, year. I was, I was more like, man, I got a good right here. Why? Right. I'm mm-hmm. trying to get another year of school. So, <laughs> you know, playing in sold out garden, my first game at Oakland Coliseum, there was like four thousand people there. I'm like, I downgraded, man. Wow, <laughs> that's that's a different aspect. Like to see it through that lens, like yo, I just went from nineteen thousand a game at the garden. And now I'm out here and it's like 4,000 people showing up to see us and we supposed to be yeah. pros. Yeah. Speaking of that, talk about how big the Big East was back then. From Providence, the Big East Georgetown, was, that was a, that was a pre conference. Like, like just, just speak on just how big and how, how the Big East changed basketball, uh, college basketball and really how the Big East 
uh, farm for the leagues to come out. A lot of the guys was coming out the Big East, and every team in the Big East was ready to go. Every team in the Big East, y'all was seeing each other in the tourney. <laughs> it was an amazing, quick transformation. Um, I think it started in 79, I think. It was the first Big East uh, season. But Dave Gavitt had coached at Providence, and then he was getting into more of a, you know, manager type situation and he had this he had this he had this thought this dream to put this east east coast they had an ecac and you kind of made your own schedule so all the coaches felt comfortable on their own they could book their own games get 20 wins get in a tournament so the coaches i think initially were, were against it you know because now all of a sudden you're going to play twice you know home and away against these great teams uh, but so anyway they formed the big east and when i was coming out of school it wasn't that wasn't a big draw to me. It wasn't, it wasn't really there yet. Um, but what it did, it kept guys in their kind of home cities. And so it kind of organically built the fan base, you know, because right. you stayed home and people identified with you. They kind of followed your career. Um, you know, Patrick left Boston, but he went to DC. Ed Pick, he went, he was from New York, went to Villanova. And we all recruit each other. We were all mm -hmm. being recruited by the same schools for the most part. I was recruited by Villanova and Syracuse. And, mm -hmm. you know, Pearl Washington went to Syracuse. And so all of a sudden, we got these marquee players staying home, not, not going to the ACC, not going out to California mm -hmm. to play in the pack. I guess back then it was probably a pack A, pack 10. But they were able to keep players home. And they had marquee coaches, John Thompson, Luke Karnasekka, Jim Beheim, mm -hmm. Rolly Matt Firmino. So, you know, fast forward five or six years later, there's three Big East teams in the Final Four. Mm -hmm. right. you know, so, and and the, 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 it just shows you, too, you know, the, the power of TV. So they were the first conference to get a deal with ESPN. ESPN mm -hmm. was just starting. They needed, a, they needed right. to hitch their wagon to something, too. Yeah, ESPN and the Big East they grew together, mm -hmm. and then we had uh, Big Monday that was on. That was yeah, Big that Monday was is going Monday. down every so, Monday. <laughs> and I, th th there's a good, there's a good. Uh, it's called the Requiem of the Big East. It's a good documentary. It's a few PC series, but that Big Monday catapulted the Big East into national stardom. You know, not just the players and the coaches, the, the conference itself. To where when I came out to Oakland in 1985, all these kids knew me already. I was mm -hmm. shocked because they were rushing home from school at four o'clock. It was 7 p.m. East Coast. Mm -hmm. They were getting that game after school. Mm -hmm. So that that you know the, the TV contract exploded the Big East. Um, yeah, so Villanova with Pickney and, and Dwayne McLean and Georgetown was a beast, dude. They were nasty, mm -hmm. you know. We, we talked about Patrick earlier, but they, they had pros, man. You know, on, on a given night, you know, St. John's versus Georgetown, Sweet you had Floyd. six, seven, eight first-round picks, mm -hmm. you know? And they were battles, man. They were battles. And, and they were, it was a really legit rivalry. Like, there was, there was borderline hatred there. Ultimate respect, though. Ultimate respect. Mm -hmm. But no, you know shaking hands and hugging all that. It was, it was more, right. go play your game and get your ass out of there, man. We'll see you. You got to come to our place next. Like we'll see you in a few months, man. That's it. This era, you know, all the kids are playing 2K, but back in our era, we started off with NBA Live. And when I play NBA Live, I played with the Golden State Warriors every <laughs> single time. Cause y'all had three guys on the perimeter that was hitting all the three pointers <laughs> back in the day. So like, Golden State Warriors, like Nelly, you had George Carl at first, and you know, Nelly sped it up. What was about Nelly that that fit the pedigree of y'all team? Yeah, you guys look back and, and you know the history of the game. Nell, Nelly obviously has the all-time most wins in NBA history. So there, there's a genius there. There's a you know, forward thinking. I always uh, wanted to play with him. Trailblazer. So it's mm -hmm. funny. D, D Miles, you say that. So for a few years, when, when Mitch, Tim and I were playing, basically every game, someone was coming up, you know, with the opponent. Yo, man, tell Nelly, man, I want to come over here and play because we were, <laughs> we were playing a different style. Yeah. Uh, we, were, we were running, gunning, and we were having fun, dude. So, that, so, you know, you hear a lot of talk about culture, right? So culture, 
you know, that's, that's like one of those cats where we got good culture. Culture to me is having the right group of people together that are, that are pulling for each other. They trust each other, respect each other. Um, and you're working really hard, but you're not looking at the clock because you're having fun. You're trying to get right. there early. You're trying to stay late. Yeah. Uh, you can't get enough of it. So the, Mitch, Tim, and I had a, had a tremendous uh, bond. You know, I think first and foremost, our talents meshed well. Like I needed Mitch and Tim. Yeah. And Mitch and Tim needed me. So there was a, there was, uh, from our talent standpoint, it was a very good fit. We are very different personalities, which was mm -hmm. good. You know, and you guys had Tim on, you know, Tim, man, he's going to, he's going to mm -hmm. bring it, man. He's going to yeah. tell you straight up. Shout out. Chicago, Chicago style, Shout right? Out. <laughs> like these country boys, nothing. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. He's going to call like it is. And, and just, and by the way, love, all of us just love to play. So when mm -hmm. I was telling someone last night, I saw Junior had 42. I was texting with Tim last night. And he was there, yeah. Yeah, so I was texting with Tim. And then I, I was telling someone, when we drafted Tim, he landed. And me and Mitch were, you know, there to meet him. He got off the plane like, yo, let's go hoop. <laughs> Straight up. He's like, skip skip the press guy. I want to go play ball, man. I want to play with you guys. So love of the game, uh, work ethic, competitor. We all had that, man. So that that our bond was basketball. That That's yeah. what brought us together. Um, and it's funny. We only played two seasons together, believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah. That's the crazy thing about it. I want to know... Um, Cause we always talk about, you know, the, uh, we talk about how nicknames come about, right? Mm -hmm. So for you, Tim and Mitch to get run TMC, which is why, I mean, y'all known out right of New York, one of the dopest right threesomes, one of the dopest, you know what I'm saying? Threesomes Oops, ever. Yeah. And, and not only that, like not only was y'all cold, like y'all did something that wasn't really seen before. Like three of y'all wing players all averaging a dub plus on the same team. Like how was that when y'all came together as a, as a trio and like when y'all got a nickname and when y'all really took the league by storm, how was that for y'all in that real time? How was y'all looking around like, man, this is like crazy. Cause usually when you get three guys like you guys that are all wings, Somewhere along the line, there's some disconnect. Like, I need the ball, or I want the ball, or whatever. So, but for y'all, it was like the perfect marriage. Everybody was in, in sync and everything was great. How was that for y'all? Yeah, I think it was, um, first of all, our, our, our talents fit, you know, they mesh well together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Tim playing with the ball, dynamic, you know, ball handler, can run incredible pick and rolls, love to throw a ball ahead on the fast break, you know, got into the paint anytime he wanted to, to collapse the defense. I mean, he, he was an incredible player for his, you know, just, just a big time player. Kill a crossover. Kill a crossover, no doubt. And tough as nails. Mitch, you know, inside out, great defender. And then the style of play, having Nelly put it all together. Um, Nelly really emphasized moving the ball. You know, we were able, he said, cute, we all scored over 20. We all got our shots because playing fast, moving the ball, that's that you have to generate more possessions to, to get those shots up. So commitment to fitness, right? Being able to, you know, maintain your conditioning. The, the nickname's funny, man. We did that pretty much as a joke with, with the season ticket holders. And it's and amazing, it's you know, a day like after Pat, we're like, come on, man, we don't want to do this. This is some bullshit. And now... 30 something years later, it stuck. Right, right. So, TMC, man. So, so that that little Dumbass thing we did after practice was actually pretty important. <laughs> yeah. When you first heard it, did you did you love it right away? Like, oh no, that's it, right there. Well, I, I did because I see what you, know, you being in New York. Run, yeah. And run, yeah, Run DMC, they're, they're Queens guys, man. I tell you, uh, Darren McDaniel went to St. John. I was all right. in on that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. So yeah, it's funny how it stuck, man. It's, it's pretty amazing. That's the crazy part about y'all. That it, they all supposed to have a way the longer impact capsule had together. In yeah, two seasons. Like, and but, but, but for y'all to be as big as y'all are to play that short of a time, lets you really know how 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 y'all was putting it down. Yeah. So how long did you guys play together? Two years. Two years. So so think about that. <laughs> think, so that's a, think about the power of sports and for us yeah. basketball. How how so many years later, you guys are tight like brothers. Yeah. Mitch, Tim, and I are like that. And actually, I didn't even know that till. I think when I was going to the Hall of Fame, we all sat down and did an interview, and someone said, you guys only played, two. I'm like, two years, what? 
<laughs> these guys are my brothers, man. You know what I mean? But that's the power of sports. And, you know, and to me, not, yeah, the wins and losses, yes. But the plane rides, the bus rides, mm-hmm. and the off season. We spent yeah. a lot of time in the off season in just sweaty high school gyms and just getting after it. Yeah, and we made each other better. And we made each other better. You know, we pushed each other. We talked a lot of junk. But at the end of the day, man, we were making each other better. Speaking of uh, Miss Richmond, like, these folks really need to the know rock. how Miss Richmond used to put it the down rock. and how deadly and an animal Miss Richmond was. Just Can you speak on Miss Richmond and just how good he was? I used to have yeah. to guard him. Yeah. <laughs> I had to guard him. I had so, to guard him. Strong so the, as. At, at the time Mitch played, he was top two, three, two-way players in the league. And you guys, you know, you're from Chicago. You know the deal, Derek. Michael Jordan said that. I don't got to yeah. say that. Michael Jordan said that. That was Michael's toughest opponent. Um, and Mitch, Mitch just has a laid back, a laid back personality. Yeah. That's, that's why his name's not out there. He's not into that. Um, but you talk about powerful, strong, inside out, in the post, guard the other team's best, guard the other team's best score, whether he's one, two, three, or four. Um, Mitch, Mitch grew up a football player, so he had a rugged style, and he was strong as anything. And then he always added to his game. You know, he came in as a post-up guy, you know, mid-range shooter, went out to the three-point line. Um, I mean, he, he was just – I mean, he's in the Hall of Fame, dude, for a reason. But right. some of the stuff he did, he came in, was rookie of the year, number five pick, rookie of the year. I think he averaged 20. The next eight seasons from 20, his scoring went up. <laughs> <laughs> so he set the bar, set the bar high, and just kept rising his game. Um, yeah, so he's, uh, I mean, an amazing player. Uh, you know, that's, that's my guys, man. That's my yeah, brothers. Man, that's so, my you guy, know, like I said, I, I thought, I, I thought you guys only played a short time together, but yeah. I mean, let me say so I don't forget. I'm really proud of you guys. I know you guys got this, you know, knucklehead <laughs> podcast no going, doubt. Uh, but. You, you trail, you, you know, showing the younger generation how to transition. Yeah. Uh, transition from, from being great players, you know, into the business world. So I'm, I'm happy for you, man. Keep up the yeah. good work. Oh, I mean, I think, you. I appreciate it, OJ. I think that's one of the coolest things about this. Like, we were doing what you just said inadvertently. Like, obviously, you know what I'm saying? We we showing a different way and all that. But I think it's, 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 it's more of a testament to who we were. Like, as much players as we were, as 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 person, as people we were, because this whole situation and everything we doing, us being able to talk to you, like even if we were cool and we did whatever, we create this podcast. I feel like the reason that we're able to get the guests that we're able to get and get guys like you to really sit down is because we were good dudes. We weren't assholes. We respected the game. We played the right way. You know, we did our. We were young and we were brash and all of that. We came in, but like. You a man, we respected the hell out of all of y'all. We looked up to y'all and like whenever whenever we played against y'all, we were gonna play hard as shit. But like we was like, oh my God, it's it's such and such. We were super fans and super hyped. And I think the way we treated everybody and the way we were with everybody, I think that's why we get that type of respect and that response. And that's for me, like, you know what I'm saying? Like you say to hear you say like we showing the young guys, this that, and the third, like that'd be like cherry on top for anything we get from doing these podcasts. Like I get to yeah. get off and tell my pops, like, yo, pops, my pops' favorite team right now is the Warriors. He watch, <laughs> he lo- he loves Steph Curry. Steph Curry can do no wrong. So, like, he see, like, he just got to see, oh, man, I didn't know the D right. Because, like, you know, I do the same thing that y'all do for Orlando. He said, right. I didn't know. Cause, like, he watching the game. He said, I seen D- Darrell doing I didn't know he was. I said, yeah, I mean, he, was, he, he up there with Chris. I'm like, yeah. And so, like, the, to be able to have – Chris Mullen, I get to get off here and say, hey, Pops, I talked to Chris Mullen today. You know what I'm saying? Like, my Pops going to be hype. So, like, yeah. for me, like, this well, is like. Well, you know, man, it's it's a it's a beautiful fraternity that we're part of. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, whatever years, you know, I played 16 years. But when I came in, some of those guys had already played 15 years. So that goes back and forward. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, the, you know, Tim being a Chicago guy, Darius, mm-hmm. I watched you come through. You almost went to St. John. There's always a connection, right? Yes. So we're, we're, we're used to getting scout reports before the game. He can't go left. He can't yeah. shoot. We also, over our careers, we establish a scouting report of who we are as people. Yeah. And you guys, and, and Q, I thought you said it right. You guys came in, 
as young players, uh, passionate, uh, alley dunking, all the athleticism, and, and started changing the NBA, the, the way the NBA was um, being played because of your athleticism and your youth. But all along the way, you guys did it the right way. Yeah. Right. You always had that um, sense of history. Yeah. And, and I felt like you guys, that passion was, I, I loved it. I love when young players come in and, and they want to do better. That's yeah. what it's all about. Yeah. Where the game is, take it, take it a step further. I, um, I, I want to ask you a question about young players. And <laughs> I'm telling my homeboy I was going to ask you this. He told me not to, but I just got to. <laughs> when Vince Carter first got to the league, I think y'all played a preseason. Indiana. And he mm -hmm. he got the ball on the wing. You step out. He swung through baseline and he like reverse dunked crazy. I remember just seeing your Ew. face like, and just you just ran back. Do you remember that play? Can you tell us about I that do. play? Like the of that, course when I do. you seen that, you was like, yeah, it's about time for me to get on the bottom here for in a minute. <laughs> um, that was the game that changed. <laughs> the game that changed, <laughs> but. I mean, he, he was a phenomenal athlete, incredible player, great guy. But I've seen that clip several times. When they show his dunks, that's one of them. <laughs> from, from a coaching standpoint, I didn't give him middle. <laughs> no, no, you cut off middle. <laughs> I, sent the, I sent them baseline, and he just went over the top of the basket. Let me give you, look, from a realistic standpoint, I don't give a damn how old you were or what was going on in your period of time in that life. Like, we ain't seen nobody else recreate a highlight <laughs> like that, period. Like, that was a one of one and one and done, none seen. You ain't never seen that dunk again. In game, you have, come on, bro. He went that, up that, and he was gonna dunk it regular on this side, then came all the way up and I ain't gonna say wiped his entire ass. He wiped his entire ass at the end. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was like an updated version of Dominique. Yeah, yes, so like, yes, and we haven't seen was. that dunk, so like it didn't yeah. even matter. Like he, that was just that was half man, half amazing. But you know, it's what funny too that, that that Pacer team I was on. We were, we were an older group. That was I'm, a I'm team. Sure, that was I'm a sure hell of a team. Game. I'm sure we won that game. Yeah, we exactly. Were I, you know, the first time I felt like that um, was when I played against Kevin Garnett. Mm. Like it might and be was, time. No, 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 no. I was still young. He, I was that was probably ninety. I was only 10 years in the league. I had a few more years left. But <laughs> that level size, of athleticism. His, his size, his length. I remember playing uh the first half. He's play, he came in as a three, as a three. So I was playing three. I'm asked something like, yo, dude, this, this guy's ridiculously long. <laughs> he bigger than mother. <laughs> but you know, he was young. I was able to head fake. But so for I remember at halftime, I told Rod Higgins. I said, dude, I think that dude grew between the first and the second quarter. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's like seven three now, man. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about swag. I used to always love your swag the way the way you was on the court. But one of the things I used to love about you, Brooklyn, New York, B, was the the high top with the fade on the side, like Brooklyn, New York. He what made you stick like, with like the we high get out, top? Was... Like I knew Mullen from everywhere. Look, he had look. a high top with the fade on the side. Like, I'm gonna say what he want to say. How did that become your he, favorite you haircut? Like, <laughs> I'm gonna say what he want to say, Mullen. You look like you get your haircut when we get out here. Yeah, the white guy was, with the high that top. That's what resonated side, with man. us. That's what resonated <laughs> with us. Like, hold on, wait a minute. All right. First thing so that stood out. If you get, if you get next time you're in New York, okay. Um, it's in Jamaica, Queens. That's where I got my first. It's called Cut. Hey, Chris nice. Bernard going crazy right now. He's from Southside Jamaica, Queens. He's going crazy in the background. It's, he know it's called Cuddies, and my man Freddie will hook you up. Oh, okay. Okay. Cuddy right. and Freddie. We, we looking for Jamaica, that. Queens. I don't got no more hair, but if you can do the pieces, Freddie. I get you right. Hey, <laughs> and plus, hey, and he's been there since 1984. So when I was in school, he opened up a shop. He's still there. That's, 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 that's what that's up. Shout out Freddie. <laughs> and in the BK. Yeah, and I got a little left, not much, but you know, I still kind of, you know, clean up Man, a little you're bit. you killing both of us, yeah. money. You good. Yeah, yeah, you good. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. all to my face now. Like, <laughs> the mold to my face now. Well, we had a lot of guys on here, and they was, uh, and a lot of guys was from the Dream Team 2. And a lot of guys said Dream Team 2 will kick Dream Team 1 ass. 
And I don't believe them. I don't want you to think that I believe them now, because I'm I'm definitely Dream Team One. You you originators. But um, tell tell us about that. Like you think that Dream Team Two had a chance to beat Dream Team One? Uh, first, you got to tell me who was on Dream Team Two. Uh, he, Derek not, he, Coleman, don't, he don't even remember. Wait, hold Shaq, on. He, he don't even look, know. He like it was, was Derek Coleman, like? Shaq, uh, L.J., Steve Smith, Gary Payton. Z. Kevin Johnson, Jason Kidd, uh, who else? That's a hell of a team. It's a hell of a team. But, uh, but Lonzo not, Moore, I not, think, was on their team, yeah. right? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, they Let had some hitters. Tell you, though. Let me just tell Reggie you, Miller. Like, we didn't have LJ, we didn't have DC. Uh, who else? Shaq. Zoe. Shaq Zoe. They all feel like it would have been nothing. No, who was the one that been, who it was said Shaq was the difference. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's always hard to compare generations, but the, the one thing that's for sure is there's only one dream team, right? There's only one time you can do it as an original, right? That yeah. was the first time. So historically, I played in 84 with Michael Patrick. We had a heck of, look up that team. Right. That was I heck remember. Yeah. The last, the last amateur College team, team. Gold, yeah. gold medal. Um, 88, Sharunas and Sabonis beat us, and then they'd opened up to pro. So it was a whole, you know, it was groundbreaking. First time to ever happen. Um, but come on, man, we're not we're not gonna give that up. There ain't no way. <laughs> nah. I but, like nah. it. Tell, tell us more about the experience though, because I know y'all was like the biggest thing in life that you're like just seeing the the old footage of it, seeing the crowd standing outside the hotel, like the yeah. how the world moved with y'all that whole tour. And uh, just just tell us about it and tell us about them, them college kids coming in there and getting that little one game and then y'all beat the shit out of them for the next week. Like, <laughs> Yeah, so I think for, for all of us, the fact that it was the first time everyone was getting in, no one knew what to expect. Yeah. Get the call, man, I was elated, man. I was like, yeah, I'm in. Cause yeah, I know so, right. so the, so, some of the guys, you know, eh, who else was playing? I'm like, I'm, I'm in, I'm playing anyway, I'm going. I'll be right. playing <laughs> basketball anyway in the summer. <laughs> yeah. So then when they when they announced the team, I'm like, yo, this is gonna be insane, dude. This is this, <laughs> these are the like, legends, that's man. That's insane, yeah. You know, gonna kick some Ma ass. <laughs> Michael, Michael and his Michael and Scotty in their prime, you know, Magic and Larry, just icons already of the league. Um, Chuck Daly coaching. It was just just an incredible group Barkley of people. Malone. Yeah, John uh, Stockton, just Stockton. You know, up and up and down. Patrick David, talk about yeah. you know, just some of the greatest players of and, all time. And Christian Leitner. Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> at, that, at that point, though, at that point, though, did you realize that it was about to be what it was about to be? And it was, you know, this was going to be like one of the they call it the best team ever assembled. You know what I'm saying? Like, did you know prior to that, like when you got the phone call, like what? how was it when you really got to start realizing like, like, tell me about, OK, I remember watching the documentary. How was it when y'all get to Barcelona and y'all bus can't even move? It's literally just thousands upon that. How was that feeling to be on that bus looking out at that? It was, it was almost comical, and it was it was a it was a steady buildup, steady right. progression. So we had a since we lost in '88, we had to qualify to go to Barcelona. So we had to play a tournament in Portland. And that right. was you know that was a good crowd there. And I remember that we practiced a, a week in San Diego. And we went to Portland and, you know, dusted up those guys and played well. And we had a, two weeks off before we flew to Barcelona. Uh, we flew to Monaco, actually, to, to, to train again. But by the time we got to Barcelona, this, this you know, media machine had picked up. And it was just, just amazing. The hotel, there'd be people out there all night long. I mean, it was incredible. So I think we played eight games in Barcelona. So each game, there was more people and more more security to where the gold medal game we left the hotel and we had you know motorcycles and, and a motorcade we had helicopters above us mm. they had closed the highway and on the highway they were pulling people to the side of the road our bus went past the team we were playing they got pulled over <laughs> we went past them <laughs> so they had no chance anyway but that that was just uh insult to injury man yeah that's crazy. Oh, that's crazy and you, and you got you know look 
Michael was at the, you know, at the prime of his career. Um, and it was, it was amazing to watch like this. Of course, we knew how great he was, of course, but he became this global icon, like right before your eyes, the big banner in Barcelona. And, yeah, the big, yeah, well, yeah, that was crazy. And, you know, I, I had played with Michael in 84. Um, you know, we played, you know, I, we came out of high school, got aside, saw a lot of things, but his, his, the level of play and his, um, you guys know legendary uh, stories about Michael. I mean, he was playing golf all day and just coming <laughs> to those games and dominating. And the one that sticks out is when we played Ku Coach. He and Scotty. Yeah, tell me about that. Cause like we saw the we saw the last last dance documentary and like to just hear and see how they were talking about it and how the other guys how I said to hear Barkley and some of those guys say I, I felt bad for Ku Coach going into that game. Like <laughs> Tell me what that was like. Like, I, you know, we all players, we know how it is when somebody like, yeah, you're not, <laughs> trust me, we about to handle this. Like, so like, tell me what that was like and then to just see it play out. Well, you know, at that point in time, not only were they two of the, you know, Michael, obviously the greatest player right. in, in the league, but they were the best defensive players. Exactly. By far. That's what you know, people don't really give my man MJ the credit for. He was a goon out there on the other side. And they, and they, and they could, he and Scotty, they could pick up 94 feet and guard the ball handler. They would chase you off screens. They could play and they could do everything. So that game, it was just a different vibe. And I, I, you know, watching, Doc, I didn't know the whole background to that. I really right. didn't. I didn't know the whole uh, recruitment of Tony Ku coach, mm -hmm. but there was a, there was a different focus and a different energy in the locker room because we weren't practicing. We weren't doing intense scout reports. We just right. made sure we played our game. We did want to set a high stand on, on how we played. You know, we didn't, we didn't want to just win. We wanted to win the right way and play team basketball. But that night, they were, like, fighting over who got it. Like, no, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's some bull. And, he, I mean. He probably ain't never faced that before. He never faced nah, nobody playing him like that before. Ever not, that, not that length, strength, quickness, and intensity. Have you, Scotty, I mean. It was like he was playing a box in one, but he wasn't. He was not <laughs> touching the ball. And yes. to where that first game, Tony was like, all right, man, if you want me out, I'm out. I'm done. Like, Right. Like, basically just, yeah. I mean, that, that was the vibe I got when you, because, you know, you could see the contrast of all of y'all talking about what they going to do and how they going to do it. Then you hear, you see Tony, like, he like, I, I didn't even know what was going on. I'm just out here yeah. to play. I'm excited to play these guys. And then it's like, oh, is this type of situation? And so you think about it, you know, you got Michael leading the league in scoring, but being able to do that on the defensive end. That, that's why he's the GOAT, you know what I mean? But who taught you the game? Because your IQ is, is, is great. No, you're not the most athletic, but you did everything everybody else did. You played the game the right way. You, your IQ level was above a lot. Like you beat a lot of cats off IQ alone. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But who taught you the game to to manipulate the game the way you used to manipulate the game? And also you kind of you kind of a rarity as far as like a New Yorker who had the the real ratchet who was known yeah. for the, just the super ignorant stroke like you had. Like you you know New Yorkers I was known for the ball handle, getting to the cup and stuff like that. Like I felt like you from my memory, it was like the one of the one of the guys that was like, okay, he's a he could shoot the hell out of the ball. Well, as Darius said, if you if you're not athletic, you better be able to shoot the ball to you know <laughs> add you know when you can shoot, you you gain a step, yeah. right? If they got to yep. get up on you, all of a sudden you might be slow, but if they got to get up on you, now you got that. Um, now I, I I was fortunate to have incredible coaches at a young age, fourth fifth grade. A guy named Jack Alisi was my was my grade school coach. And was the first guy to introduce me to like skill development, working on my working on my right hand dribbling, working on my right hand layups, and we would just progress from there. Going to the gym by myself, so so that I was introduced to that. That was taught to me. I didn't know about that. Um, through grade school and high school, my, my freshman year, I was a point guard. My my first year, I was five mm. nine, five ten as a soft mm. so I grew later. But another blessing was I was by the time I was a junior, I was six four, six five. My coach kept me in the backcourt, though. I had mm -hmm. I had grown up as a guard, wow. and when I grew, I was the tallest guy, but he, he let me play guard still, so that was that was an advantage for me. Um, and at St. John's, Coach Carnesecca had coached in the ABA, so he, he played an NBA style. 
Uh, and he was always, you know, if we, if we put in offense or defense, he would always explain not only what we were doing, why we were doing it, why we were doing it, where it came from. He was yeah. very into what like, he's trying to achieve out of it. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I had great coaches. That, that's where that came from. And I do think too, you know, you guys are athletic. So you, you see the game a little differently. You know what I mean? Yeah. As a slower kind of playing under the rim. That's just how I saw the game, yeah. you know, getting open off screens, you know, using my teammates to get open as opposed yeah. to just the ball and ISO, you know, yeah. little things you just pick up. And as far as, um, you know, New York guys, you know, Q, you said it, they're known for their handles and dynamic shot making. A lot of that comes from, uh, that doesn't happen anymore. But once April came or May, we never was in the gym. We were in the park. We played right. outside. All, right. all, all the summer leagues were outside. Um, so some days it's windy. Sometimes you, and so seriously guys, you know, there's no nets on the Rams and you're just driving the ball, trying to get that thing in. I think that had a lot to do with it. Um, but the combination of both being well coached and skill development. And then when I was in, I went to school in Manhattan uh, as a freshman. That's when I was introduced. I, I started playing for this Riverside church, which is up in Harlem. Riverside. Uh -huh. So I had the combination of, you know, kind of skill development and, you know, fundamentally sound. And once I got to play in the inner city, I kind of put those two together. Um, and that's where my, my big time love, I love going up and playing in the, in the pack parks, man, and going up there with, you know, some, some speculation, like who's this dude walking in the, in the, in the park, man, he don't belong here. And then by the time the game is over, you're like, oh, okay, you can come back. Coming out there like Billy O, <laughs> Billy O. <laughs> Tell me about that. Like, you know, you from you from Brooklyn. You play high school ball in Manhattan. You you went to Harlem and the Bronx to play. And then, like you said, you a white kid walking up in there in the in the, in the hood park. Like, how how was that for you? And like you say, the satisfaction after you bust them up. You you know what I'm saying? Was it that Billy Hoyle feel where it's like, man, can this kid play? Then you get out there and you tune somebody. Like, how was that for you? Yeah, it's like pressure. Felt pressure. Felt like, man, if I don't perform, I'm done. I can't yeah, come back. Let you play right. no more. <laughs> you know? And then, and it, and you got to do it every day too. It's not just yeah. one day you're in because that might be a fluke. No days yeah. off. Back, no. You know, in the '70s and '80s, you know, Harlem was a little different than it is now. Now it's exactly. you know, it's back. It's a renaissance again. But back then, you know, I played with some great, great players. Kenny Patterson. You remember him from DePaul? Kenny, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. He was nasty. Ed Pickney was on my team. Ed Pickney. Uh -huh. Pearl Washington, you know, we we had a bunch of great plays, but several times when I first started going up there, you know, if we play like say four in the afternoon, it was getting a little dark. Ed Pickney would walk me to the train station mm. to make sure I got back in there. And then about you know a few games in, I was good to go. That was kind of hanging up there. Then after a while, I never left. That that was right. like home for me. So, you know, you talk about pressure and you know whatever it be college and NBA. That was the first time I felt some pressure to perform mm -hmm. in a different way to get to be accepted, to gain your respect. Exactly. But that's really what we did our whole careers, right? Mm -hmm. To me, the best um, form of accomplishment is the respect from your peers and your teammates. Man. Exactly. Man. All star games, all those other things that are voted on. But when you have the respect of your opponent and your teammates, that that's really what we play for. That's, that's, that's the better. biggest thing. That's the biggest thing. Nothing like when, when the guys respect you, your brothers at arms, they they respect yep. you. It's like, oh man, you you got it all. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you about a player that uh, played with you at Go State too. That was one of my favorite players, Marcelonis. Oh yeah. I thought he was Cerrone. nice. Yeah, like Marcelonis was nice. He's one of them guys that I used to play on the game with and do all that stuff. And he's one of the, the, you know, the first guys come over here and, you know, do his thing and, and you yes. know, have some success in this league. So how was that uh, when Marcelonis came over and started playing with you guys? I'm glad you asked about him, Darius. I, I think he was the trailblazer. He was, there was other players before yeah. him, obviously after him, but I thought the first guy that came over and had a big time role on a winning team and like carved out, and he was an NBA player. Guys were coming and going back. Yeah. yeah. Staying for a little bit, not not making it, but Sharunas came over on a really good team. He was highly touted. Yeah, everybody wanted Sharunas, and I mean, if you, you should watch um, 
There's, there's a documentary called The Other Dream Team. You should check that out. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So it was in ni- 1988, Sharunas played for the Russian national team. Mm-hmm. And probably half of that team was Lithuanian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. yeah. So in 92, they gained their independence, and mm-hmm. Sharunas put that team together. He was the best player. He was the fundraiser. He was the he did everything, and they wind uh, up getting a bronze medal. We one of the most amazing stories in sports. So they oh, would do that. Eighty eight, they won a gold for Russia. Ninety two, they got the independence. But anyway, he was at that time with us. He might have been he might have been the strongest guy in the NBA. Mm. Seriously, said he was stronger than yeah, strong He had cra- crazy hands. He would go down and not knock the ball. He would go to with two hands and just take it from people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We talked earlier about Scotty and Michael, how great they were. I remember one game, and Sharunas was one of those guys, a little bit like Bernard King. As an offensive player, he would punish you. He would hurt you because <laughs> mm-hmm. he was so strong and just drive, always left. A.K.A. Remember, Corey Maggetti. There you go. Hello? Hello. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I remember we were playing the Bulls, and Sharunas was shooting a free throw, and I happened to be at a half court with Michael and Scotty. And they're like, man, you guard him, man. I'm not, I'm not trying to get banged up with this dude, man. He's running <laughs> me over, man. But, That's real. But one, one of the nicest guys in the world. Um, I've been over to Lithuania several times to visit him. But yeah, he, to me, he was a trailblazer. You know, he, Petrovich was on Portland, so he, he didn't really explode till he got to New Jersey. Yeah. But Sharunas really, I thought, I thought was a, a trailblazer for the international players. Yeah, and again, because of the respect, the guys respected him. He came yeah. over, you know, mm-hmm. back then European players were, they were shooters and they were soft. He was mm-hmm. the opposite. Yeah, he right. was a driver and he was tough as now. Yeah, I remember when he came over, I just thought he fit in with y'all so well. Like uh, he instantly started playing, playing good. He just like fit the team. <laughs> and think about that. So 88, him and he, they beat Mitch's team in the gold medal and we had both of them on our team. Right. Him. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's dope. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me this. How close, if at all, were you to becoming a Nick? Because I see it say you signed, you know, you signed just your nine-year deal. I mean, obviously you weren't that close because you never became free agent. But did you ever, in your mind, I know, you know, we all, like, I'm from Chicago. I thought about it at some point, like, playing for the Bulls. Did you ever want to play with the Knicks prior to signing that, you know, your nine-year extension with the Warriors? Yeah, that's some of I had talks with them. I had thought, I thought about it. Um, and back then, like I said, we didn't have that rookie scale. So I, I was on a four year deal. And back then to get your unrestricted free agents, they had something they called right of first refusal. So I played on my four year deal. I would have had to play on a one year deal and then become a free agent. So I would have had, a, that was a risk. So I, I was, I thought about it. We had some, some conversations, um, but I took the security. I was very, I had also gone through some stuff off the court. You know, I went to, to rehab and really got my life together in the Bay Area. I had a really good support system here. I was happy on the court, uh, had things figured out off the court. So it was more of, it was as much a basketball decision as it was a lifestyle decision. I'm yeah, still here. Comfort so. zone. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You played on the dream team with Larry Bird and now you in Indiana playing for Larry Bird. When you playing for Larry Bird, you got your guy Mark Jackson over there throwing his dimes and, you know, doing his shake. And you got one of the best shooters ever in Reggie Miller to play with. And uh, y'all a contender. Y'all was definitely a big contender in them them years. How was that to have Larry Bird as your coach and, you know, the Indiana and the team that y'all was playing for? It was awesome, man. That was um, the most low-maintenance team I ever played on. We We had a bunch of vets. And that was by design. Larry was not trying to come in and coach, uh, you know, yeah. a rebuilding program. He he hand selected his guys, and obviously I knew Larry from the Olympics. Um, and Larry, t- you know, before he took the Pacer job, he was doing some stuff with the Celtics. I remember going in there. I think the year before he took the Celt- uh, the Pacer job, I saw him at the Boston Gar. We talked, and you know. I always stayed in contact with him. And then when he got the job, he gave me a shot. My, I had a year left on my deal. I was, I was renegotiating here with the Warriors and he got that job and, you know, he needed a small forward. So I was like, yo, I'm all in, man. That's, you know, that's one of my, one of my idols. Right. And you talk about Mark Jackson, Reggie Miller, 
Rick Smiths, Rick Antonio Smith. Davis, Dell Davis, Davis, Davis boys, Derek <laughs> Jalen, Jalen Travis, Jaylen. Al Harrington, John yeah. Bender. Yeah. We, had, we, had, we had a great team, man. So so that those three years, man, we, we went to two conference finals and NBA finals. You mm-hmm. know, so we big time success. Um just just a bunch of pros. Sam Perkins, Mark yeah, West. Yeah, yeah. And no, no show up to work. Do your work. Larry Bird was as as transparent and straightforward as he as he played. He just kept it real simple. You yeah. know, he did, he only had a few rules, be on time, you know, share mm-hmm. the ball, you know, play, play hard. Very simple, man. He just kept it the, the way he played. Um I think initially everyone was a little intimidated by him. You know what I mean? He was almost too quiet. You know, yeah, right. very, very compliant. I remember they got that clip when Reggie made that incredible game winning shot. He just said like this. You mean when he <laughs> cheated? You mean when he cheated and he pushed MJ? Yes, that one. <laughs> yeah, that was a cheat play. I can literally tell you exactly where I was when that Q, happened. Q. Q, let it, go, so let it go, man. Let it go. Let it go. No, I will. They won the series. Let it go. <laughs> no, I will. I don't care. I was at. Okay. I was at. I was at USA Olympic trials for the what with eighteen seven whatever whatever group. I was in my senior year. It was ninety eight. We were in Colorado. I remember a lot of the guys there was Colorado guys. Colorado Springs. Oh, Colorado Springs at the training facility, and. I'll never forget. I'm telling you, know me. I'm Chicago. I'm talking all type of noise. Whoever want to listen, Bulls ain't losing. I'm used to this. Mike then won. Look, whenever Mike and Scotty that we gonna automatically win. We spoil this Bulls fans. Like I thought the year they lost to the to the Magic, that was a, he came back against the Pacers, and I was like, it don't matter. We winning. They the, he back and Scotty we back. We won. We didn't do it, but then when they did that, I can remember. I, I don't remember who I was about to swing on somebody that day. <laughs> at, the, at the Olympic trial, fools talking mess with me. I'm like, they cheated. I don't care what nobody say. He pushed Mike and they allowed, like Mike almost fell. Skinny ass Reggie Miller ain't about to get no push off on MJ. And he go like that and it wasn't no real foul. I was, wow, well, so hot. I'll never forget that. I can remember being at the USA Olympic trial and that happened. And he went and bowed and bowed and half court. I wanted somebody to just cross check him. <laughs> But then we had game seven in Chicago hey. and Scotty was hacking Mark Jackson the whole night. So they got his back, it all evened out. Yeah, yeah. man, this is the best part about that was when he said, hey, the championship still got to run through Chicago. So I, well, I knew Mike was pissed when he said, it. I could see it in the interview and I was like, we good. I took two, that- three, Two three-peats, man, you can't beat that. Hey, I'm uh, spoiled. <laughs> I don't know nothing about that. He like a bull supporter, but you know. He for me, Saint, you know. If they had a team, he had to ride with them like his Cardinals, you know. You from Brooklyn, home of the best two rappers ever, Jay-Z and Biggie. What was the first CD you bought with your own money? You gonna make some pop fans fine, mad, bro. I'm gonna leave that doubt there, though. I mean, my, my playlist is as diverse as as my teammates across the board, dude. I right. got, I got, I go from Pop 70. Every day, yeah, 70, I, I'm like that too. <laughs> Studio 54, classic vinyl. <laughs> um, rock the Bells radio, you know, I'm, I'm down with everything, man. But, but, you know, growing up, I remember when I told you I played for Riverside, I used to meet the van on Saturdays on 125th and 2nd Ave, right in the middle of Harlem. And we get in a van, we go play, in Brooklyn, Queens, we play up in Hall and we, we take a van together. It was the first time my teammates had, the, you know, their box, you know, yeah. big boom box mm-hmm. with the cassettes. I'm like, damn, man, that's nasty. I like that. <laughs> but, but you couldn't hear on the radio. I only heard it. They only had, and they would like, make me a tape. I bring it back to my neighborhood. Like, dude, what is that? Because it wasn't on the radio yet, believe yeah. it or not. It, you know, in the 70s. But you talk about Big Biggie and Jay Z. So funny story. Run DMC. Run DMC. So Daryl McDaniels, part of Run DMC, was my classmate at St. John's. Wow! Wow! And you also you also know Jay Cole's was St. John's grad. You know that, right? Yeah, yeah Jay Cole. Yeah. yeah. We we got you know Queens got a little little, little history with the rap game. You know. <laughs> and don't forget not Nas over in Queensbridge and. Yeah, so we, we got we, New York's, you know, 
everyone claims that I think I think it started in New York. If, it, if not, we'll we'll take that though. We'll take that. Right, right. Can you imagine shooting 15, 17 three pointers in one game? <laughs> well, you the way were, these guys do not, or you watch that boy <laughs> regularly. <laughs> Can you imagine getting them them shots up like that? Like I was telling them, like back in the day, they guy wouldn't even shoot that many threes in pickup ball. <laughs> like, yeah. like now to see them getting them off in the game. Can you imagine you doing that? Well, that's that's like that's the biggest change in the game is the three point shot, the, yeah. the 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 number of shots taken and the and the players' ability to make them. You know, Steph, Clay, Dame, Dame Lillard, they're on a different level. Like th- those guys are a whole different level. But the game itself, the spacing of the three point line, where, where guys play, you know, three and four feet behind a three point line to space the floor, uh, to be able to drive the you know drive the lanes and things like that. That's the biggest difference in, in the game of basketball. I think for the better, but I still think when there's a balance to it, you know, and, and ultimately the quality of three points. Now, if you can generate 50 quality three point shots, I say take them all. Mm-hmm. But there's a fine line between just launching up threes and, he you know, drawing, drawing, <laughs> well, drawing kick off double teams in the post. Transition threes are always good. So finding the balance of both, I, I still, I still think. You know, an open 18 footer. That's my ring song. <laughs> you like that? Yeah, yes, I like sir. that. Brooklyn representative. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Uh, we'll put my wife on hold. Uh, yeah, so so the three point shots, been, but. Generating those threes, getting quality shots. I think the teams that, that win the championship, they still have a good balance of threes, fast break points, points in the paint, free throws. Mm-hmm. Just to, to to put a timeline on my my college career, we played no shot clock, no three point line. That's almost a different sport. Mm-hmm. And you was putting up a yeah. dub without any of that. So, mm-hmm. it's just, but also it's a slow pace. You know, we might run three three plays to get it get the shot we want it. So yeah. the game has changed, but you know, to me, you know, you look at the guys, you know, they can make them, man. They practice them, can make them. The one thing I did that I see the Warriors play different. They, they play Steph moves without the ball. You know, he's perpetual motion and, and, you know, he can play with it, play without it. But that cookie cutter offense where you run high pick and roll with two corner threes, that offense puts the defense in his own, yeah. right? So mm-hmm. you got two deep corner threes, you got the high pick and roll. You're basically putting the defense in elbows and boxes, which yeah. is really a zone, right? That's so two three, you're in a two three, <laughs> right? So 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 finding the bat. Of course, you want to shoot these, but I think you know, like the Warriors do a good job of it. Um, San Antonio's always been pretty the the you want the balance of motion with you know trying to find your three point shots, I guess. But again, I think you know. Shit. Your original question, Darius, I'd love to shoot 15 threes again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this question I like to ask, OG. Like you from Brooklyn, you from the BK, you know, humble beginners and stuff like that. When you first, first started to get that bread, now I ain't talking about, you know, you took care of your family, you got a house, you did this. What did what did Chris Mully do? To treat himself, something that you look back on, like you got that money. I probably, probably should have did that, but it felt damn good at the time as a young fella to be able to go out there and do this. I want to hear, I want to hear something foolish, man. What did you do, OG? What did you do to treat yourself? Right after, I know it was right after you went and got the, you know, you got the the good shape up and the fade and everything, and you went ahead and had your way. Well, what what did you do? I mean, it took me a while. But- my first two years in the league, I was still living in Brooklyn at my at my family's house. And my, okay. my parents, they wouldn't leave. They didn't want to leave. Mm. Um, I finally bought a house on Long Island. Mm. Oh, okay, out in that LA. Was, that was the first year I really, you know, I bought a house locally, but, it, you know, I needed that. And, right. and, my, and my car, stuff I needed. That was the first, so, so to have two houses was big for me. Right. Like, mm-hmm. A house yeah. on the West Coast and a house Two different East. states. That's balls now. Nah. You know what I mean? So <laughs> East that, that West Coast, like, man. That, that was unheard of, man. We, yeah. We barely... <laughs> so yeah, so it was it was that it was the house to, to have space and you know have a pool and you know, like that. So and have, you know, 
walk out in the backyard if you don't want to, you know, put clothes on you didn't have to. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, yeah. I got my own, I got some acreage, you know yeah. what I'm saying? I can, I, I can go to the backyard and go to the bathroom, man. No one's going to say anything. <laughs> well, yeah, hey, that's what my privacy buys me. I post this privacy <laughs> do whatever I want back here. I like that. Yeah. All right, man, that's been a wrap, man. We had a great time chopping it up with this legend right here, man. Mully, we appreciate you for pulling up on the young kids. Knuckleheads in the building, y'all. Yes, sir. Be my, you, my pleasure, man. Yes, well, sir. Appreciate you, OG. <laughs>